<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now I'm going to present the uh, uh, the the team from Sweden. Uh, we got a mix up of our presentations over here, I guess. See what happens. And this is the indeed the slide that's selected out for me. Quality indicators in the Netherlands. Uh, you've heard the title. We're trying to build a team from rivals. And I had to think a little bit about the rivals in our country, the Netherlands, and I came up with some rivals. One of them, the water. As you know, Holland is below sea level and we have to combat the sea all the time. And what we did back in the year 2003 was with rivals in the healthcare and there I seek out the, health, uh, the uh, rivals like medical specialists, of which I am one. I'm a cardiologist, clinical cardiologist, but also representing the Dutch Council of Medical Specialists. We have these medical specialists who are looking for indicators to improve their quality of care. But they were not likely to share that with the public, nor with the healthcare inspectorate. They were trying to prove their, their, to improve their own quality. Then we had the hospitals who were looking for indicators how to improve the care in, in their hospitals on all kinds of levels. And we, and we had the healthcare inspectorate who was trying to focus on, is the quality of care good enough in Holland? And how do we do that if medical specialists keep the data for themselves, if hospitals are not transparent? Um, so there was no collaboration. We did not know where everyone was working on. We did not share the same goal. And then we decided on a new journey that would bring us together, who would get the water out, and to develop a system in which we all helped each other achieving our own goals and by doing so improve countrywide quality of care. So we had to work together to get a water away. And how we did that? We selected indicators and we did that in collaboration with the healthcare inspectorate who was named the owner of this set of data, the Council of Medical Specialists, the Federation of Hospitals, both university and non-university hospitals, and the National Nursing Association. And we sat together two times a year, and uh, the medical professionals, so that's the doctors and the nurses, sat together and put forward the indicators they wanted to see to improve their care. That was discussed in a team together with the health care inspectorate. Uh, and uh, it was discussed not to shoot down these indicators, but how could we further improve on them? These indicators then were proposed to the hospital federations, and they were looking, can we implement this in our hospitals? There was, um, actually, they were not giving any room to decline these indicators. They were given the room to improve on them. And the indicator then was proposed to the board meeting where we all sat together. And in 85% of cases, these indicators were adapted to be asked the next year throughout all Dutch hospitals. And in seldomly, the indicator was declined and was, get, and was put through again to the system. And what we managed to do in this, process, in this process was that the professionals proposed their own quality indicators. The hospitals had a chance to modify them so that they too could get their internal quality control. And the healthcare inspectorate was, if this all, if this would work okay, they could safely assume that the care uh, was under the control of the care providers, and they had a set of indicators to motivate the quality of care, and they had the possibility to intervene if hospitals lagged behind. An example, the Dutch Surgical Colorectal Audit uh, proposed an indicator where in a few years' time they were going to see the amount of reoperations for colorectal surgery. And in year one, the indicator was put forward to uh, 
built a system in which all patients were included in this registry. And then in year two, three, the percent of reoperations uh, re were counted. And the result was that in one year time, or in two years time, there was a participation from two to 98 percent. And that was amazing in Holland, because we, we took years to build a complication registry, for example, that took us over 10 years, and we still didn't succeed in getting one registry all over the country. And here you see in two years time that we got a lot of participation, And at this moment, where we stand, we have 12 themes of indicators for hospital care. For example, surgical care, oncology, heart and vascular. Uh, we have 62 indicators. And what we did do was, if there is a new indicator, uh, end-of-life ones, or the one who had uh, proven successful, were removed from the set. So not to build on, build on, and build on, but to have them... Uh, a, a set of indicators that we could oversee. There's an annual reporting to the healthcare inspectorate, and this is openly accessible. Uh, the indicators are retained as long as they are successful, as I mentioned before. For example, the indicators on the theme of surgical care were the percent of patients with a pain score above 7 in the first 72 hours post-op, the uh, resurgery after hip fractures, etc., it does help to improve care, because that, of course, was to the aim that we set out. Uh, I told you about the participation rate in the colorectal audit. This morning, uh, Ronnie van Diemen of the Healthcare Inspectorate of uh, the Netherlands uh, alluded already to the mortality uh, drop in pancreatic resections that took place over a year, over four years' time. The bed sores were reduced by 80%. Malnutrition rates were uh, down. There was a residual tumor after breast cancer surgery in four years was down. Uh, we had much more thrombolysis after stroke in three years just by putting in these indicators and also monitoring these indicators and the healthcare inspectorate going to hospitals that lag behind. So we think that we had found a fertile approach to improve the quality indicators in the Netherlands. Not only that we could get rid of the water, but were able to grow some flowers on it. And I would like to leave you with that message. Thank you. I think I'll hand it over to uh, Jason, who is going to tell you how the Rifling teams in Scotland. <laughs> so so we, when we planned this session, we are trying to give you an insight into what four countries have done around measurement, broadly. Whether it's registries, whether it's whole system measures, whether it's very granular measurements. So my job, in case you haven't noticed the accent, is to give you the results of the Scottish jury to that question. So if you can't understand, turn to your neighbour. They may be getting the words you can't understand, so... It is English I'm speaking. It, it, it may just be slightly quicker than you're used to. So I'm going to go, try and go quite fast because we want some questions at the end. And Joran is speaking and he always overruns. So if, unless, we, unless we go fast, he won't get enough time. So let, let's talk about Scotland. This is what Scotland looks like from satellite. It, it, it is actually tartan coloured if you look at it from, from space. Each of these different coloured tartans is a healthcare delivery system. We have 14 delivery systems. We have eight special national systems, like one ambulance service, one improvement service, one education service. But we have 14 delivery systems. We have about 5 million people. We have 12 billion pounds. And we have integrated delivery of primary, secondary and public health within these delivery systems. And we're moving with an act of parliament soon towards true health and social care integration, so we will move our health and social care work together. At a Scottish level, across the whole nation, we have a set of whole system measures. And we have a set of outcomes, we have a set of ambitions, and they're not just about health care, they're about the whole of Scottish society. They're set around ten guiding principles, they are open and transparent, they are independently assessed, they are publicly available on the web, they're meant to be simple, they're meant, you get the idea. And they're based around a cascading set of measurement through our whole system. 
And I'm going to show you the top level of this in just a second, but ranging from our purpose at a top level through some targets, through object, you get the idea. Down to very granular indicators used at a citizen level for whatever the thing might be. So, if you look at the coloured section in the middle of the slide, our strategic objectives for the Scottish nation are to be wealthier and fairer, smarter, healthier, safer and stronger, and greener. Understood and shared, communicated with all of the citizens of the country. You can see the government's purpose to focus government and public services on creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increasing sustainable economic growth. And then there are objectives underneath those five topics, wealthier and fairer, healthier, smarter, greener, that are the strategic obje objectives of the nation. We live in a Scotland that is the most attractive place for doing business in Europe. Our children have the best start in life and are ready to succeed, and others. So within those national outcomes are a set of healthcare purposes, healthcare outcomes. So now we're getting further down that cascading system. So you have a thing that says Scotland will be healthier. It doesn't really describe what that is until you get slightly further down. So now we say we're going to reduce premature mortality. We're going to improve end-of-life care. So we're not quite at how much by when yet, but we're certainly getting more granular in the Scottish system. And I can show you the same slide for greener, for wealthier, for safer, for smarter. So this happens to be the healthier box. And then the healthcare system, jointly with the Scottish Government, because we have, at some level manage that healthcare system because it's centrally controlled, regionally delivered, we then start to think about what that might mean for the delivery system. So these are our six health and healthcare quality outcomes around staff, around safety, around people having the best start in life in their early years and best possible use of, of resources, staff and finances. And then we have actual measurement. So I hope I'm illustrating to you that cascading set of measurement right through from the Scottish Government purpose at the very top all the way down now beginning to think about what that might look like if you're in a ward or if you're in a primary care practice or if you're in a social work environment, what it might mean for you there. So what does it mean to have care experience, to have your under 75 mortality, to have self-assessed general health for the population and to have a measure of end of life care. So to illustrate that within the healthcare system we have quality ambitions, so safe care, person-centred care and effective care. Underneath that we have those outcome measures I've just shown you. And then on an annual basis we set some targets. We used to have 230, now we have 14. And we set them around priorities, around waiting time priorities, around financial targets. Around, so we don't have many, but we have some performance managed targets. So one of our targets is everybody will be seen within 18 weeks of referral. So the treatment will be done within 18 weeks of referral. We have a number of targets around oral health in children because we've decided that our oral health in our kids is so poor related to the rest of Europe that we take it out and we set it as a performance managed target. We do that for some small, some big targets. Underneath that small set of targets, we then have our improvement work, our high impact changes which we decide we will allow the boards, the healthcare delivery system to use. So that's around our safety work, around our person-centered care work, around our efficiency work, whole load of things. And I'm going to illustrate them with just some more granular examples before I finish. So one of those high impact changes is our safety work. And our safety work, the big measure of our safety work, and in the quality outcome measures, is our hospital standardized mortality. Now, in this room, we're not really discussing what has happened to the measures, but I would be remiss if I didn't show you some of Scotland's data. But the purpose of showing the data is how it fits into that whole Scotland performs thing, how it fits into that whole data story. So this happens to be Scotland's hospital standardised mortality from 2006 to September 2012. And that, since the safety programme began at that dotted line, is a 12.5% reduction and at 8,500 less than expected deaths. I can't tell you the safety program did that. I can tell you it happened during the time of the safety program. That's a subtle difference. You can draw your own conclusions. Other things were happening. 
So I can't tell you that the safety programme did it. I, I do have another graph for another day which shows a trebling of the increased reduction over time. So something has changed in Scotland over that period of time. Then at an even more granular level, so that's at a country level, this is now in a single intensive care unit. So in a single intensive care unit, the National Clinical Lead for Safety in Scotland, a man named Andy Longmate and one of his nursing colleagues, Sean Mayer, who one or both may be in the room, have worked incessantly on ventilator-associated pneumonia for many years. And you can see there's lots of lessons in this graph, and I'll go relatively quickly, but the fundamental lesson is the safety programme begins in January 2008. We don't teach them to brush teeth and put the head of the bed at 30 degrees. They already know how to do that in this intensive care unit. They're very clever critical care doctors and nurses. What they can't do is do it reliably. What we teach them is how to do it reliably. They get the bundle of care above 95% and they eradicate pneumonia. So the measure they are counting is reliability of the bundle and pneumonia, yes or no. That then relates up to mortality. It relates up to financial balance. That then relates up to healthier. That relates up to the Scottish Government purpose. Am I, am I making some kind of sense around where that works? I could do that same cascade down to a community pharmacy, down to a school, down to a prison, and the measurement that applies at each of those levels. In some places more mature than others, of course. It's not all fixed. This is what a measurement board looks like in a ward. This happens to be at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. This is a ward inside Glasgow Royal Infirmary where they keep their own... I don't tell them what to put on this board. They choose themselves. As long as it relates to that overall purpose. So within that Scottish Government purpose is the ability to allow individuals to change and count what they want to do at that granular level. So that's the Scottish story about how we do measurement within our system. Thank you for listening. So you're now going to get, are we switching or are you going to get Joran? Sweden, next. This first picture shows how Scotland looks at Sweden. They see the sun. <laughs> no, sorry for starting like that, Jason. My name is Göran Henriks and I work in the county council uh, with 340,000 inhabitants. And I'm going to try to describe our situation concerning quality indicators and comparison in our country. But first, just a little uh, background. We have in, in uh, Sweden 20 county councils and 290 municipalities. And both systems today are very uh, intense with measures. And we are compared in everything all the time. And we have uh, open comparison in social work, we have open comparison in nearly every disease and we try to help the Swedish care system to develop through benchmarks. And um, I just wanted to show you a little background picture. This has not come through uh, just an idea. This show uh, world's largest per capita producer of medical publications and you can see that Sweden is uh, in the top and most highly cited countries in clinical medicine Sweden is also among the countries in the world that are cited often. The work with quality indicators and the national registers started already hundred years ago and uh, today, the National Patient Registers includes 50 million discharges for the period 1964 to 2006. And it includes all inpatient care since 1987 and since 2001, also outpatient visits, including day surgery. So we have a very uh, measure-intense system. And uh, the National Quality Registers uh, contains individualized 
data concerning patient problems, med medical intervention, interventions, and outcomes of the treatment. And if you use this link, you can find all the data, both in Swedish and in English. And uh, the purpose of the work is, of course, monitoring, but also improvement and research. And uh, since 2006, the different areas of care and social care get this kind of reports where all the measures are collected. Now, today we have 169 indicators in healthcare. Now I do not talk social work uh, that we use. And uh, of them, 73 are from longer time series uh, on a national level. 65% of them are divided in men and women, and 90 only women and uh, two only men. And 69% of the women indicators shows improvement, and 71% of the men indicators shows improvement. And here you see some areas that uh, these different registers cover. And the National Quality Registers are sponsored by the uh, Federation of Swedish Healthcare System. So, and 90 registers get today extra money to develop the register work from being just a yearly uh, summary to become something that feeds back uh, your work every day. Now, uh, Michael Porter says that uh, with its strong tradition of this register, Sweden is poised to become the world's most advanced nation in measuring the actual outcomes of care across many diseases. And this uh, citation or quote comes from our government, so they show really that they are interested to continue the development of all these quality registers. Now, on the system, system, system top level, you can see that we have different performance in different areas of the country. And if you map it like this with colors, you can see that uh, the different regions have a variation in their performance. And Every year we summarize our performance on a high level, and here is example from patient experience and satisfaction. Here is example from access. Here is example from cost per inhabitant. And there you can see that if you live in Stockholm, the inhabitant paid 22,835. And if you live in the neighbor healthcare system, they pay uh, under 20,000. So uh, there is a difference uh, in the investment in the service system. But that, of course, doesn't mean that there is difference in the results. So through these different summaries, we learn a lot of how uh, our uh, performance looks like. Now, these are, of course, also very good for public health. And I wanted to show you how um, we can see that pregnant women that, are, women that are smoking in Uppsala, it's only 3.75% of the women, but in Western Norland, it's 8.6% of the women that smoke. And... Um, those kind of figures, I think, define our future cost of healthcare. So we benefit a lot from these strong measurements. Finally, a little about how the government and the national level looks into the future of care. They believe that by using evidence-based medicine, national guidelines, research, and um, 
knowledge from an institute that evaluate new care and combine that with understanding of how to implement care programs and local guidelines, they can develop a much better care. And we have also then, with all these quality indicators and open comparison, developed a very strong evaluation system. For me, there is always something we have to remember in this approach, and that is that all this I have shown doesn't matter anything if we don't know how to use the measures <laughs> in a good way. And therefore, I want to f end with a picture where I try to describe what is most important to become successful with measures. That is when you involve part when you develop partnership with the individual and relatives in your improvement work. It is when you have a process orientation using dashboards on all levels as described in the previous presentations. And you, in the daily work, use the measures both for learning and for research and not split that into two different worlds. Research and learning is the same coin, but different sides. And that you need to develop a special knowledge around how to coach the use of measures. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. You know, when I saw the subtitle, uh, Building a Team Out of Rivals, I couldn't help thinking about a TV show that are very popular amongst most of the European countries, Strictly Gone Dancing, because that's where a celebrity partner with a professional dancer, and then they compete with other teams. And sometimes the teams dance together, and it's really impressive what they can do in a few weeks' time, how they can learn celebrities to dance. And in Denmark, we had a very anonymous, uh, our former prime minister's wife was extremely anonymous, but all of a sudden she jumped out in Strictly Gone Dancing and became very, very flamboyant. So I thought about that uh, when I got this title, and uh, you know how flamboyant can indicators really be but a lot of you have come here uh, today, and usually there's a lot of energy in, it, in the room when you start to discuss uh, indicators, and we'll get back to that after the presentation here. First, a few words about uh, Danish healthcare. We have, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, our healthcare system is uh, regionalized, so we have uh, about 100 municipalities that takes care of primary care, nursing home, home care, and so on. We have five regions that take care of specialist care and, um, and uh, general practitioners. And then the government takes care of legislation and uh, negotiating the finances for, uh, for the healthcare system with the regions and municipalities. Denmark is caring for 5.5 million uh, people. It's uh, predominantly a public health care system with uh, free and equal access, freedom of choice, um, finance through general taxes, um, and uh, the GP is the gatekeeper to all specialized care. Uh, the trends in the Danish health care uh, system is there's a, an enormous reduction in the number of hospital and, uh, hospitals and in the number of beds. Uh, we have... Uh, an ongoing centralization and specialization. We have fewer hospitals with uh, emergency departments, and um, there's a lot of focus on pre-hospital emergency care and on intermediate care. When it comes to rivalry, I think the one that should really be competing about having an uh, a clinical indicator would be patients with special diseases because whenever an indicator has been agreed upon, it, at, it draws a lot of uh, attention from leadership in the healthcare system and it draws a lot of resources as well. 
When it comes to uh, inside the system with doctors and the hospitals and so on, I think um, on the clinical level there's a rather little rivalry because if you are like an obstetrician, I mean you can put an interest in through the obstetrics indicators and have a genuinely inter interest there. And uh, there's really not much competing of your interest when it comes to that. But when you go to the hospital level, the um, hospital directors, their attention is really competed about because they have a lot of uh, clinical indicators to look into and there's very little prioritization between them. So uh, when it comes to rivalry, I think that's where, uh, where the question goes. Previously, <clears throat> I think we have done a lot of uh, measuring for benchmarking and not so much for improvement. And uh, there's been some uh, 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 confusion about that, that you could either use it for one thing or for the other. We are, have been very good in measuring in silos and are not too good in measuring across uh, sectors. We have a culture that... Um, in some uh, areas accept mediocrity because of the way we are measuring, and I will get back to that later. Um, the way we are measuring, we don't see patients and relatives as a resource. We have no prioritations of the different aims that we have. Uh, because of Denmark is a very consensus thinking country where all stakeholders must agree, it tends to um, decrease the value of some of the uh, indicators that you can agree upon. And although we know that we need to deliver more for less, we do not really act uh, as, if it, as if quality and safety are part of the solution. These are the, the, this is the way that I have, dis, uh, that I have tried to uh, divide the indicator system into. We have some uh, system level indicators, and in Denmark it is uh, hospital standard mortality rates and it is patient satisfactory survey. Then we have uh, 62 national clinical quality indicator databases, uh, and then we have something that I have called special interest indicators. We have uh, one for cancer and heart disease care bundles, and we have one for cancer waiting times. And what drives these um, special interest indicators is usually uh, public pressure when, the, when there's uh, really bad coverage from the press. Uh, it often can drive an indicator to be performed. And that has been the case with, uh, with the two that I'm mentioning here. If you look into uh, the um, system level indicators, we have a yearly patient satisfactory survey it covers uh, to all topics from waiting times to uh, patient involvement to experiences uh, of errors and to intersectional collaboration and so on. It's an enormous survey. Um, there's so many that patients that are participate in it that, um, that actually the survey is representative on departmental level. And the way that the uh, results are given back uh, to the departments is that they can um, <clears throat> compare themselves to, um, to, to comparable units. And then they get to know whether they are average, above average, or under average. And that's what I mean by saying that sometimes we accept mediocrity because there's a huge, uh, uh, the vast majority of the units will be uh, on average. Then there's a few that are above average and a few that are uh, below average. And if you are average, a lot of people think that that's good enough, then let's spend our, uh, let's spend our um, attention on something else. Um, there's also lots of discussions whether we are using the right method, because when you're looking at the results of the survey, more than 90% of the patients are overall satisfied with the healthcare system. So it's not a survey that really drives um, <clears throat> improvement since every one is pretty happy with it. When it comes to um, the other system level indicator, the hospital standard mortality rate, we have used it for as long as Scotland since 2007, and we have had the same uh, decrease, a little more than 10% over the last, uh, uh, what is it, four uh, or five years. 
uh, I can say that the HSMR is published uh, quarterly uh, on hospital level. Uh, we do not use it as a benchmarking tool. We use it as a tool to see whether improvement are taking place or not. Now I'm going to give you an example of one of the special interest indicators. That is waiting time for cancer patients. If you're cancer patients in Denmark, you have the right to have your diagnosed within two weeks and treatment within two more weeks, etc., etc. And since there was a lot of uh, 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 public attention to uh, these waiting times and patients were waiting more than these weeks, uh, it was decided to make an indicator. So now the CEO of Health from the five, each of the five regions has to sign a paper each month saying how many patients waited more than the acceptable waiting times. And um, the numbers are questioned whether they are true or not. And, uh, but that, that's, like, uh, that's an example of an indicator that are uh, pushed on uh, because of, uh, of the press. When it comes to clinical database, they have been standardized over the last couple of years, um, uh, and they have to fulfill certain co uh, conditions in order to get uh, financed. All results are public, but uh, they are difficult to access and they are difficult to understand if you are not uh, a healthcare professionals. Uh, clinical ownership has been maintained in it, um, and. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes there's a delay from the in data, uh, from you put data from the department into the database until you get the results out of the database. Um, and many of them are used as a benchmarking tool. From December, I think, 40 of the 62 clinical databases are fed into the hospital's leadership information system, which is a huge uh, advantage. Uh, it's possible to understand the results on the individual patient level. So when a department gets their results back, they can actually pull the patient's uh, name and find the charts and go back and see what happened really in, the, in this case and why are we where we are. Uh, and many departments have still uh, tremendously trouble in using the data timely on departmental level, whereas others has, uh, has solved it. So uh, this uh, should be my last slide. And uh, so we have moved from what I showed you before to a situation today where uh, there's more and more understanding of how to use uh, the indicators both for benchmarking and for improvement. And um, the cancer and the heart disease bundle is uh, beginning to monitor across the silos that we have uh, and uh, <coughs> we are starting to prioritize the different, uh, the different uh, aims uh, by having put up some national aims uh, for reduction in mortality and reduction in harm. We still haven't been very successful when it comes to using patients and relatives as a resource. And uh, I think we are beginning to act as if uh, we need to deliver uh, more for less and quality and safety is uh, part of the solution on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Now, do, would the four speakers like to come up and join us up at the podium here? That would be super. Now, while, while they're coming up, let me just let a bit of reflection. Uh, I'm Donald McCauley. I'm one of the editors at the BMJ. And just reflecting on some of the, 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 the facts that you put up, Gore, and I was really interested in your, your slide there showing the research output per capita. And, of course, Sweden is very high. And we get lots and lots of registry studies at the BMJ for Sweden. And they are really very high quality. So that data is, is is really what's the key to your measurements across the county councils. But let me tell you the story from the Netherlands, because in terms of primary care research, the Netherlands has the most outstanding registries. Now, let me tell you a little story about how they started. Uh, an old friend of mine, uh, Franz Huygen, who was the first professor of general practice in the Netherlands, was in Nijmegen. And when Franz was appointed as the chair of general practice, he was invited to give his first lecture. And he went across to give his lecture about rubella, German measles. And while he was walking across to give the lecture, the professor of pediatrics 
phoned the secretary and said, why is he giving a lecture on rubella? Rubella is a pediatric condition. And from that moment, Franz said he was going to count every patient he saw in practice. And that was the very beginning of the registries in general practice in the Netherlands, which have gone on to become world-recognized. And general practice research from the Netherlands is probably, I'm, I'm sure UK people will forgive me for saying, is probably the leading research in general practice that is available. But it's not easy. And Beth, I mean, you pointed out the difficulties of the registers and how you're creating these registers. And, of course, getting rivals to work together. And that is the key. Getting people to accept that they're prepared to give their data in, share their data, and at times perhaps be showing up not to be as good as their colleagues. And that is a real challenge. And of course, that's the big challenge in quality indicators. Something we in the UK faced, particularly with QA for the quality indicators in general practice. They're now very well established. Like them or loathe them, they have been very effective and they give tremendous data. I'm sure Jason, you would agree that the, the quality indicators in general practice are really tr tremendous now. So, let's open it up to discussion. Katie, Elizabeth, how are we getting on with Twitter feed here? Come up and sit in the front seat so, we, so we, can, we, we can have a chat about it. Now, folks, any questions for our team here? Yeah, we have a question here in the front. Do tell us who you are. Yeah. Uh, my name is Riwa. I'm coming from King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Riyadh. And um, my question is to the second speaker, Dr. Marcel. I'm interested in the ventilator-associated pneumonia. Uh, the bundle. I know that um, you succeed by implementing the uh, elements of the bundle, but I would like to know, are there any other external factors that you added to the bundle in order to succeed for this ma maintaining uh, zero uh, VAP infection? So, so, if you mean by, so you'll have to tell me if this answers your question. Wh what we did was we took the bundle and we used a collaborative to get it embedded across the 22 intensive care units in Scotland. So we used a method. The bundle already existed. We adapted it slightly for the Scottish context, so we didn't use the IHI bundle as they have it. We used a Scottish version of the bundle, and that was developed by our intensive care society. So our doctors and nurses designed it. But we then used an improvement science methodology to put it in place. We used the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, which is a collaborative. A, a big learning system that in, happened to include 37 interventions, one of which was the ventilator associated pneumonia bundle. So that gave leadership attention, it gave transparent measurement, it meant we were putting people in a conference room with 800 other people who were all focused on that same agenda. So the bundle itself existed, but we built a learning system around it. We happened to choose a collaborative methodology to implement it. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, in a broad way. You need a microphone. Yeah, but um, any, uh, there's no specific elements or, there's, uh, or is your uh, Scottish bundle different than the IHI bundle? It is different from the IHI bundle. In what but, way? But only a little. So, so our, our bundle is brush their teeth, head of the bed up, sedation vacation every day, and weaning plan. Mm -hmm. So the IHI original bundle also included prophylaxis for peptic ulcer disease and DVT prophylaxis. But it was, a, it was a ventilator bundle, a bundle for people on ventilators, not a pneumonia bundle. Ours is specifically a ventilator pneumonia bundle. It's the same bundle that the Danes have used. They call it the Danish ventilator bundle, of course. And, <laughs> and, and uh, it, IHI have begun to use it in other parts of the world. It depends what you want to do. If you want to reduce pneumonia, you do the four things that will reduce pneumonia. Thank you. No, we have a couple of questions. Elizabeth, you come and join us here because you're listening to the Twitter feed. Take a look at this audience. Do you think, are they a young, trendy, interactive, hip audience? I mean, you know, I, I know you're overwhelmed with tweets here. How many tweets have you? We haven't had that many tweets. What? What? Come on, guys. Get out, get out there. Come on. Yeah, let's have a bit of interaction here. Because it's other people listening to, into it as well. It's not just the people who are here. Tell, tell us what we have. Okay, we have one Peter Kozman's. Oh, hello. Oh, to, no. oh, he's oh yeah. yeah. He's going to wave. He wants to get young. involved. There's a, there's a man for the future. <laughs> young, trendy, good looking. You know, I mean, he's going to make it. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> okay, Elizabeth, sorry. Go on. Um, 
So he tweets, developing quality improvements needs a multidisciplinary approach. Um, is there any experience with involving patients in developing quality improvements? Yeah. Your hands are mine for that. Yeah. Just take it and turn there, guys. Um, in Sweden, we have a fantastic uh, process around um, rheumatology. And uh, today, uh, in uh, most of our care systems, the patients themselves uh, fill in uh, the register. And uh, the platform for that work has been uh, developed through focus groups with the patients themselves. Staffan Lindblad is the name of the professor that runs this. In the Netherlands, that's, uh, that's about the same. Um, we're working on integrating uh, patient data, um, and the data are either um, their perception of care, um, etc., uh, on a diverse set of diseases. So we're incorporating that, but it's not as much as that it's incorporated in the data set that I've shown you over here. That was a data set put together with the professionals and the inspectorate. And after that, we've been de developing data where patients uh, are involved also to pick out their indicators. What is it that patients want to learn? And we're still developing on that. Oh, yeah. We have uh, the same with the rheumatology databases in Denmark, but I think that there's an enormous resource out there with patients and relatives if they could be more involved in what indicators are important to them because it really drives the attention of the, of the whole the, uh, clinical community, what, what you have in these indicators, and uh, I, I think we could use it much more wisely and to a much greater extent that we have done. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, folks. No, I Kit, do you have someone there? Yep. Okay, say so. Good. Uh, hi, sorry, Richard Hamlin, um, Health Quality and Safety Commission from New Zealand. Um, Beth, I, just looking at your slide up there, I, t I read the top bullet and cheered um, to see somebody sort of with the flexibility of mind to recognize that the same data could actually tell you slightly different things. How did you go about, uh, how has that been accepted in your country? And, and uh, has it, been a, has it been a challenge to get people having that degree of flexibility? And if so, how have you gone about that challenge? Could you please repeat the question? I'm not sure I got it. Sorry, of course. Um, just very aware of this dichotomy between improvement and, and benchmarking yeah. that people draw out. And it uh, can often be quite a challenge to get sectors to get, clinicians to get, people we work with into a mindset that actually the same data can play both roles. And I'm just curious whether you found it a challenge to do that, and if so, how did you go about uh, dealing with that? Okay. Um, usually a lot of the clinical databases has come out with yearly reports or yearly numbers and so on. And yearly numbers are extremely difficult to use for improvement. You need to have smaller and uh, very... Uh, uh, and take samples much more often. And of course, all the no you have all these numbers at the departmental level. But the way they, a lot of departments think that they put things into the database and the database is going to feed the information back to them. But they have to think it otherwise. They have to think that we are using the data for improvement and then we're also putting them into the database and we can get benchmarked later. So they have to use them timely. Is that, does that answer your question? Um, yes, that's, that's extremely helpful, actually. That's, that's a very nice uh, way of putting it. Uh, and did you find that people actually moved into that mindset quite quickly? When no, they I think it? that uh, it has moved there very quickly. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, still have a lot of, uh, we still have a lot of challenges with it. But some departments have solved this uh, problem, but others have not. Some of the clinical databases have solved the problem, and others have not. Thank you. Katie, we have, a, we have a question here, and Elizabeth, you have a, a tweet? We have another tweet. Um, so this tweet, it asks, from a leadership perspective, what has been a unique challenge slash failure that you have learned from? 
That's a good question. That's a good question to be asked in an interview. Now, you'd like this job. What what challenge in terms of leadership yeah. and failure? Well, I can. Uh, the the thing we learned is that that you have to do it together. That's of course an open statement, but it really I think it really is true. If you uh, if you put uh, professionals on a system and you have to tell them what you have to register and what you have to do, then it's not going to work. Um, so in the Netherlands, I think we quite succeeded in uh, putting up this database with the help of each other. And uh, I think that is the challenge, uh, to get people work together uh, and trust each other in developing indicators and not throwing away indicators just because it's put forward by another party. Um, and I think that's the way we got around it. Still po it still poses some challenges because once in a while, of course, you, you are encountered with a group of people or with a hospital or with medical specialists who just uh, refuse to take part in, uh, in this uh, set. But I think we've evolved in the last 10 years that uh, that, that hardly happens ever anymore. So, so I, I, I think we've learned that, I keep looking at you, but it's not your question. It's yeah. somebody in the crowd. Or it could be somebody. Oh, there's oh, there a question right there, three rows back. So she just did that to jump the queue so she wouldn't have to wait for a microphone. The, I, I think we've learned that measurement is is uh, not an end in itself. It's a tool to get to the end. It, we, we spent too long counting, thinking it would lead to improvement. Counting doesn't lead to anything other than counting. What, what you require is you need to link that to an improvement method in the same way we've just answered the question about pneumonia. It's all very well counting the bundle, but what are you going to do when your bundle is 64% and you need it to be 95%? That's the key. You clearly need that intelligence in order to drive the improvement, but it's only part of the story. So I think linking the measurement story, which I illustrated in Scotland, to improvement methods, improvement programs, driving the change is, is the key lesson we've learned. You can't do one with, well, you can do one without the other, but you'll not achieve anything. Anyone else wish to contribute? Gorn or Beth? Um, <clears throat> there is a tension between research improvement and accountability. And uh, with modern information technology, the power of measurement can become so much more obvious. And uh, I think that we need uh, leaders with uh, uh, very good values when we carry all those measures into the daily work, because it is easy to throw statistics to people that work very, very hard and try their best all the time. So to balance that dilemma takes uh, good leadership and uh, I think also mentoring. So um, the people who are doing the work and their questions can come in foreground and not the need of the result for the whole system always. Of course, both are very important. Beth? I'll pass on this one. Okay. No. Hi, I'm Dr. Rachel Knight. I'm a trainee medical informaticist um, and recently left respiratory medicine. And my question to you is, um, I work for a company now, and one of the key things that we see is the infographic representation, the way that we communicate these statistics, not just to the clinical community, but to the patient community as well. And I noticed during the majority of today, the most of that infographic presentation is with kind of the, the very standardized bar chart. Is there not a way that we can actually utilize, it's not just about the statistics and the data, it's the way that we represent that in a manner that communicates on a much more fundamental level how important that information is. So, so that's why we need you to qualify as a medical informaticist, I presume. <laughs> 
So if you want to move to Scotland and help us do exactly that, I'd be, I work in I'd be delighted. To, I'd be delighted to have you. So, so I, I, I think you're correct. I think the communication of that data in a meaningful way to all stakeholder groups, in order for them to be able to drive and help improvement, whatever it is. I only had 10 minutes. I couldn't show you some of the things like in our early years work, which you heard perhaps a little bit of this morning from Maureen. We we have run charts drawn by children around bedtime stories. So, so that, that is a beautiful way of illustrating how that measurement is happening with bedtime bear in nursery schools. They are, they are learning on pieces of paper with felt tip pens how to do measurement. That, the, the, the way of illustrating that measurement is so powerful when you then illustrate that with families, with kids, with adults. So I, I, I couldn't agree more. However, if we're going to then do the research, the robust piece, we need to start learning statistical process control properly, and the journals need to start understanding that statistical process control is a legitimate way of showing data. Yeah. So, so both sides have to start to play that game. Okay, the journals have a place here. Guys, any other contributions in the presentation of data? Of course, the presentation of data, and it's really changed dramatically recently. And I mean, informaticists are the people of the future. They're the people who, who, who distill and organize our information for us. A little bit, I think you have some information for us. Yes, so Dermot has tweeted Should clinical quality data be published at a unit or an individual clinician level? And, and that, that was me at the back. I, I've tried both methods, so uh, I'm waiting for you to say I'm young and good-looking, but obviously not. So we have, six, we have 60 seconds left, so clearly we can't answer. But, but, but <laughs> the, the point behind it is that in England, we're going towards uh, a lot of pressure to publish data at, at individual clinician level. And what's happened in Leeds, has, I'm, a, I'm a medical director of a trust, in, and it's made clinicians very nervous about data at an individual clinician level. And I wondered if the panel had any thoughts as to whether data should be done at a unit level or at an individual doctor level. I think it's very important that every level in a system or organization own their own data and are a part of the decision how it, the data should be used. And that is a key challenge for modern healthcare that we throw up data and we don't know how it will be used. So uh, I agree in the ethics of the, what, the ethics that uh, I can hear behind the question. But on the other hand, that cannot stop us from using measures and data because it is a very strong possibility to find the variation and make care better every time. So, uh, there comes the leadership. I can't think of anything in modern healthcare that is the responsibility of one individual. I can't think of a single thing that is the responsibility of one person. There, every single element of care is now a, is now a team-based sport. So, that, that may be two people, it may be a team of four, it may be a variable team. Shifts change all the time, so, so I, I don't think we should, we should point the finger at single individuals, but I do think we should get as granular as we can to allow people to see what their process and outcome measures are around what they are trying to do, and we should do that in, in a co-produced way with them and their patients. It's a really important and interesting question, isn't it? Now, I know there's a question in the middle of the hall, but there's some, someone here has a question in the meantime. No, we're not finished. So, hi, I'm Leif Dahlberg, I'm Professor of Orthopedics and in charge of one of the quality re registers together with Karina here. Um, patients, integrity, I would like you to comment. I, I think there's a lot of discussion about that we are afraid that the patient wouldn't like to share and the patient integrity. But if we look at what patients are sharing on the net today, I would say the patient are the least uh, afraid of sharing uh, data. It is the profession and the government. So I can see a, a, a discrepancy. Have you asked the patients if they would like to attend with their uh, healthcare data into the registers, or is it we that are believing that they will not do it? Okay, well, we'll ask you to be really brief and we'll have one final question. Okay, guys. I think it's uh, not the question. I think this is a very important uh, 
metaphor for all of us, and uh, that is something we should strive uh, after for too. So I agree. To we we do 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 that. We use patient reported outcome measures. Um, and the thing about that, of course, is that it, that it, uh, it looks for a different kind of quality. Um, I, I, I'm a bit reluctant to put it all together into one number, and then this, uh, this doctor or this department get, gets just that one number as a compilation of all the input that you get from indicators. The patient reported outcome measure is a very important measure, but it's not the only measure. And I think of it as that you get a, 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 ra a row of measures. One is patient reported outcome. The other is technical outcome of a surgery, for example, or another quality outcome, and then line those up. And, well, it's, eventually it's the patient who is going to make a decision, perhaps, on these numbers uh, on where he or she wants to have his or her operation. Um, I think that is as good as we can get it right now, and we're looking into the future, of course, of how can we do better, and that's why this uh, forum is for, to develop ways on how to improve our care and how to measure our improvement. And our final question. Yes, uh, Paul van Nat from the Netherlands, from St. Antonius Hospital. Um, I have a very practical question. Um, I'm also involved in uh, some of the initiatives to, uh, to um, uh, select the outcome indicators uh, for uh, heart, um, heart care for coronary artery disease. And um, at, right now we're at the stage that you have a, we have a set of indicators and probably that will also be uh, used uh, at the national level. But I experienced that now the, the medical specialists that are involved, they, they see the results, uh, they're asking, okay, what's next? How to use these indicators? And I think this was discussed also a little bit, but um, we're just, this is just a very practical question. What's the next step? Because there are so many things that can influence an outcome indicator that you, yeah. I was wondering if uh, someone in the panel can give some practical advice. Thank you. Well, the practical advice, of course, is start a discussion. What do these indicators mean? Um, we, we start up measuring, and, uh, well, it has been told before, just have the measure is not enough. The thing is, what are we going to do with, this, with these measurements, and how are we going to use them to further improve our care? And, of course, medical specialists, or at least some medical specialists, are reluctant to show their data uh, because perhaps they're afraid to get a low rank in the newspaper or whatever, but that is not the way you should look at it. We should have uh, the, and, and I think that's part of leadership, uh, how to convince everyone that these data are not just to get a name strike through uh, out of the profession or whatever. No, the data are used to improve the quality of care that we are going to use eventually as well. I mean, uh, this morning there was a question on how many patients were there in the room. That was asked in the auditorium. And I was s puzzled by the fact that there was, there was hardly any. Well, we are all patients, at least, and if we're not now, we are, we are one in the future. So we are all have to build on our quality of care. And there's a discussion, of course, also about these indicators that you are alluding to in the Netherlands about cardiology that has a, a, a bit of a historical background that I'd like to discuss with you uh, afterwards, I think. Um, but indeed, this is an indicator set that we, that, that we, I think, we have to use to get further on in our quality of care. There is, there is room for improvement, can even I, in I the short, Netherlands. Can I shortly uh, respond? No, I think, I think we'll let you have this discussion afterwards, if you don't mind, because I, I think okay. the question of where we go with the quality indicators is a really good note to end, because that's what we're going to discuss over the next couple of days. Can I thank you all very much? Can I thank Elizabeth and Katie? Can I thank the team? And I can thank, thank you all as an audience. It's been great fun.